Welcome. This is the Ag Engineering Podcast, where we talk tools, tips, and techniques to improve the sustainability of your farm. I am your host, Andy Chamberlain, from the University of Vermont Extension, and this podcast is supported by Northeast SARE, providing grants and education to advance innovation in sustainable agriculture. We're trying to improve the industry by chatting with farmers and getting their input on tools, tips, or techniques that have changed the way they farm for good. Many of these practices affect multiple areas of the farm. Whether it be environmentally, emotionally, physically, or financially, we share the knowledge to promote sustainable agriculture, lifestyle, and business. Thanks for having a listen. Now, let's get started. Today's episode comes to you from a farm in Moncton, Vermont, where we meet with Silas of Last Resort Farm. He grew up on the farm, but has been farming more actively the last eight years and even more actively the last three seasons now that he's signed a lease to own agreement. This farm does 80 acres in hay, 15 to 20 acres in fruit, vegetables, and cover crops, and currently have three 30 by 72 high tunnels with three more on the way. Their markets are wholesale, retail, farm share, as well as a farm stand, and they're bringing in between two and three hundred thousand dollars. Silas Doyle Burr, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Andy. So I just painted the picture of your farm. How would you describe what you do in one sentence? Well, we're a small scale, family owned, diversified, certified organic farm producing uh, twenty seven different crops, including veggies, berries, maple syrup, hay, and hemp. I'm sorry if that was a run-on sentence. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was that was good. So today's topic, we wanted to talk about berries. Uh, specifically, you were bringing berries to market not just in June. Uh, you, you were bringing strawberries deep into the fall, and I want to know more about that. Uh, it seems pretty new, and um, was it hard? Was it easy? Was it a hit? Yeah, happy to talk about them. All right. Was this your first time bringing bringing berries this deep into the season? Well, we've done, uh, in the past, and um, my parents before had trialed uh, smaller amounts of day neutrals and kind of to mixed results. Um, but it, typically it's been just, the main focus has been on retail. And um, we scale it a tiny bit up, but really um, the focus was on retail again. And uh, in, in terms of price points, it becomes more of a challenge to be competitive wholesale, uh, and also in terms of labor, I mean, berries, that's, that's the biggest expense for pretty much anything in farming, but especially organic berry production. So I don't know how scalable it is, but for our specific markets, it it did work well. And I'm happy to talk about that. Were the customers excited for berries all season long or did they get bored of them? Well, that's, yeah, that's a good question because, um, kind of a mixed bag in the, the timing of it it has taken um, some experimentation in terms of when you fruit. So part of the practice is um, with day neutrals, we're growing on plastic and so we're pulling the runners, but for the first three months, we're also uh, pulling the blossoms. So these are uh, bare root plants, day neutral plants that we're putting in in the spring. And um, so those first three months, I mean, there's some leeway as to when, because you could let them fruit anytime you Hmm. obviously want the, um, the plant canopy to be large enough, the root base to be strong enough to support good production, good yield. But we actually have found that we want to time it. Um, and this also has to do with, um, you know, right after June bearing strawberries are just about done. We're also harvesting garlic. So we, we try to time it sort of a, a couple weeks after June bearing are done. And, um, seems like we have sort of less customer fatigue, which is definitely an issue the other challenge that we ran into was customers and it really does start from August all the way through whenever we finish um, harvesting, which is, you know, the past two years has been uh, mid November really, which has been great. <laughs> well, I guess it was early November for us, but um, this, this past season, but they just ask, uh, are those yours? Do you grow them? <laughs> Where are, are they coming from? California or, or Florida or, um, and so, I think that as more people do it, probably the consumer awareness will increase, but it's, and that I think it speaks to maybe the challenge that wholesale might face because 
unless you're getting that face-to-face interaction with customers to tell them, hey, these are our berries. Um, you yeah, know, they're mine. They, yeah, <laughs> these are, you know, uh, so we grow two varieties, Seascape and Monterey, um, and tell them about the var- varieties, um, maybe show off a little humble brag about what you know about growing them. And then, and through that, you'll build up um, consumer trust. But without that face-to-face, um, and this is, you know, it has to do with, that's the challenging of, of sales in general with really anything in ag, but the difficulty of selling something that has been commoditized on a larger scale and trying to get away from the commoditization of agriculture. And the way around that is building a relationship with a customer. And so when they're walking into the store or they're coming to the farmer's market, they see that relationship and hopefully associate that with the the trust that they have behind that that you're not using you know pesticides that you're not supposed to um that you're using the either best or the most flavorful most nutritious varieties or cultural practices that uh you know that you have to offer so the customers were a bit skeptical of skeptical yeah 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 (laughs) exactly you were bringing more than just strawberries to market in the fall too right Yes. Yeah. So, um, in the fall, are we talking berries here yeah. or, yep. Um, so we do a fair amount of fall bearing raspberries as well. And so several different varieties and we also, so it's a mix of red and yellow raspberries as well. And not, uh, at least around here, not a ton of people grow yellows on a, on a really large scale, just in terms of yield. So the variety that we have is Kiwi gold and all of our raspberries right now are outdoors. We are building another hoop house and we'll, we'll put some fall bearing indoors because of SWD, spotted wing fruit fly pressure, but they're all outdoors and yells are really susceptible to sun scalding. And this fall, for whatever reason, I mean, I'm trying to, I think it was a pretty cloudy fall maybe, but we didn't have, uh, or maybe it was just timed right with production, but we didn't have that issue as much. Uh, but yields are definitely lower than say, so like a classic red, like heritage or something like that. Your farm has been growing berries for many years. Was it your idea to try to extend them past June or had your mom experimented with that prior? Yeah. So um, my folks had definitely experimented with it. I did, um, I trialed it on a slightly larger scale and um, we did, we picked up a new farmer's market, um, the Burlington market, which is, has been a pretty good one for us. And, Berries in general, very difficult to grow, especially organically. So we grow 27 different crops right now. Uh, From the sales perspective, it's much easier. You don't have many crops where I feel like there's such a significant amount of pull. This is, this is a great pull. Uh, (laughs) uh, There's, there's tremendous demand and there's obviously significant price point pressure um, from, you know, large scale farms like Driscoll's where berries are available year round. But the major difference, there's such a clear um, discrepancy in terms of quality. And that has to do with the type of varieties that we're using that really wouldn't um, handle well in terms of, uh, you know, shipping or all the requirements for logistics on a, on a wholesale level. To get back to your, (laughs) your question, which was, you know, I guess, why did I decide to, or um, why grow day neutrals, which is, it's nice to get that season extension. Um, For us, as I said, it's um, in terms of retail sales, it's great. And it is, it's um, strawberries have been a fixture of the farm for a long time. And our one crop that we've kind of focused on and tried to specialize on more. um, And we just have great um, customer recognition and demand for them. Now that you've been growing day neutrals for a few years now, uh, do you think you're going to keep doing it or what do you think you might do differently? Yes, we're definitely going to keep doing it. Um, so last year put in 2000 plants. Um, and like I said, we had berries through, uh, early to mid November demand was great. I think in terms of quality, that's the real question. Um, uh, especially for an organic grower, dealing with SWD pressure, which we don't have to deal with, with the June bearing plants, and then also um, tarnished plant bug. And we didn't have 
a tremendous challenge with either of those. And um, it seemed like, I mean, our raspberries were right next to where the day neutrals were planted. And so they seemed to be a nice little trap crop. Um, and we did find that, you know, um, picking as soon as they're ripe helped keep things really clean. And I think with a small plot like that, we were able to do it. It was definitely a challenge. And the other thing about, uh, you know, picking that size scale is so it was based on our retail, how much we could sell retail. And that's another thing about growing on that scale is we're able to keep everything really clean. And we um, some of the ways that we went about doing that is we do grow all the day neutrals on plastic. And then also we used weed mats. And then we were actually picking uh, generally every other day, but that's still, that's, that seemed enough to control certainly SWD, tarnished plant bug. We really weren't focused on wholesale markets. So sometimes the retail quality, um, they'd have some cat face berries and customers were okay with that. I think if we were trying to cater to the wholesale market, yeah, it would have been a real challenge. <laughs> um, and then, so you'd probably look to, and so if we do end up deciding we want to scale up and that's that would be more of a question in terms of labor if we want to take on that much labor and feeling out the market for it. Um, but I think you'd have to figure out, well, what do we do with these cat face berries? And that would be kind of more of a value added question, which we're, we're not yet pre- prepared <laughs> to face. Uh, but another thing about keeping things clean is we were able to better control botrytis, which, um, you know, especially late season, those cold, you know, damp type days, it, it becomes a real challenge to control. So you can pick the pick the field pretty darn clean, which helps yeah. with pest management. Mm-hmm. Are you picking the berries that aren't of edible quality too, just to keep yes. the yeah. keep the field clean? Yeah, yep, um, definitely. And uh, th- and that is, I mean, even with the June bearing, we do try. So we'll, we'll go through the with a five gallon bucket at the end of each day and try to pick out all of the you know, bad berries. We used to, when we had chickens, um, we'd call them chicken berries and we'd pick them up <laughs> and then feed the chickens. Um, but now they either in the compost or, um, if possible, we find, you know, other value added. So that's a second pass. You come back through the end of the day. They're not picking. Cr- yeah. Junk so, berries at the same uh, time right. So the, if it's, good. uh, right. If it's, um, if we're doing the day neutrals, then have people place them uh, we actually generally have people bring an extra container with them. And so that's, that's hired labor that's going through and you have an extra bucket and that's, those are seconds with in June bearing, we try to employ the help of, uh, the pick your owners and sometimes it works <laughs> better than other days. But, um, it is, if you fully explain it to people are at least on board to if they see a bad berry, they'll just leave it in the middle of the row. So one, we found that, yeah, that's, that's kind of a, a quicker solution. Then we can just um, have one person at the end of the day run down, especially while we're pulling over the um, protective netting for bird protection. And also those berries that uh, we're okay with cedar wax wings, you know, eating them. And so those that's usually the low hanging fruit for them. And, ah, and gives uh, them it something can be to kind chew. of a trap crop. I'm not, you know, that's probably not the best solution, but um you're going to set up a laser for us next year. <laughs> we won't need it, right? I don't know. Uh, lasering out those cedar wax wings could be a challenge. You'd be challenge. lasering out your pick your owners right. as well. <laughs> <laughs> Keep your eyes above yeah. the well, canopy. That'll be a, a, another episode. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, so this is, it's, I like where this little tangent is going. How This seems like a challenge in the June bearing. So June bearing, do you have straw between the rows or is this? Yeah. And that's, um, so that was another thing that because this was the first time that we did, um, a larger scale of, um, day neutral plantings. Oh, always we didn't have straw in between. And so what happened is we had, we do have uh, pretty heavy soil. We had ended up having such heavy compaction in the aisleways that when you were picking, it was pretty uncomfortable if you were going to pick on your knees and so, yeah, uh, people either had to stand or um, in, in term, ergonomically done a lot of picking. I mean, I think on your knees or standing up, I myself, when I pick, I don't really notice a, a difference in speed. If you're picking on your butt, that's another discussion. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it just might not work out on our farm. <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, I, so it, it was just a, a point of sort of discomfort that, 
we haven't realized before because we we do so we mulch um, for the June bearing uh, generally in in November just after uh, the weekend after Thanksgiving we spread rye mulch over the top of all of our um, June bearing plants um, and then just um, them out into the aisleways and so that you know serves many functions but one is you know added comfort on the knees um, keeps the berries clean etc dry those june bearings are those planted in dirt or in plastic those are yeah so we do matted row so everything's planted in the in the soil yeah now back to pick your owners picking bad berries and leaving them in the aisles do you find that it's pretty easy to go back through and clean those up or is it really a challenge to to field strip clean your three acres of june bearing yeah so so we're fruiting two acres um it's yeah i mean it's always a challenge it's a question of you know how much labor do you have and at the end of the day is it worth it uh labor into picking scrap yeah i mean so in terms of uh fungus control we have uh my parents have implemented a no spray policy and so not using any fungicides and sorry this is during fruiting um we did this past year use oxidate during blossoming and that actually did help pretty significantly but we and you know it's just part of our our niche i guess customers know we don't spray and so in really wet years yeah being able to have the labor to pull out all the the rotten berries it's it's a challenge but it does uh, again our it depends on the customer but a lot of pick your owners have been pretty helpful in that and it's just about you know being organized making sure everybody knows where they're going is um you know staying in their row and clearly marking off where they've been and then that will then uh dictate or tell to to the crew oh we need to walk through these areas to pull out these berries so you've got pick your owners marking where they've been or staying in row we we use a flag system wow yeah Yeah. i've not seen that before yeah yeah um and actually so at the uh new england conference two weeks ago um there was actually a, a really awesome pick your own operation where they provide small white buckets for customers to directly put those bad berries in mm. and then they bring them back. And they also call it um, charge an admission fee. So uh, I think that speaks volumes to their customer base, which sounds amazing. <laughs> um, and I'm not sure. I don't know how that would work, but it's, a, you know, we'll definitely experiment with it. Um, and maybe it's something fun that people will do. I don't know. If there was an easy way to, to correlate, like right. if you get 80% of the bad berries, you know, what's yeah. that, what's that really doing to your, to your yield? You know, if sure. you could, if sure. you could Is add it, that up, then you yeah. could easily incentivize, like you pick a quart of bad berries and you get 50% off your next one or something like right. that. Right. Yeah. I guess it's, uh, it's not easy to quantify, Right. but, yeah. um, yeah, I mean, if you can get <laughs> Pick your own customers to do it, then uh, I think it's clearly a benefit. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly, yeah. give the kid give the kids something to do. <laughs> right, right. Um, any key points that we haven't chatted about yet? We've kind of covered a couple of varieties. Yeah, I mean, I guess with varieties, we haven't really talked about uh, how we decided on that. But the, you know, there's a number of sort of variables in terms of flavor, um, firmness. The day neutral varieties do tend to be more firm, and also there uh, at least uh, consumer perception, and it certainly has been um, my stereotype too with these berries is that the flavor is really bad. Um, and we actually the the flavor this past year was pretty good. Um, there are a lot of things that can impact that, and you know based on soil um, nutrient content, amount of sun, um, but. It, you know, we've found two varieties that have worked for us and have a good shape, seem to hold up pretty well, um, but at the same time have good flavor because that's, if you're selling to the retail market, that's going to be the most important thing. Do those two varieties you picked size up pretty well too? They, yeah, um, pretty good size. Um, we do find that Monterey tends to be a little bit larger um, and was a bit of a heavier yielder. Um, I actually prefer Seascape in terms of flavor. How about the uh, shelf life of day neutrals versus June bearing? Do they have any longer time or is it still pretty yeah, short? Yeah, uh, 
we grow 13 different varieties of June bearing <laughs> and all have their own unique um, characteristics. So uh, that's for some varieties, they hold up better. Others, uh, I mean, Cavendish, Jewel, those guys hold up pretty well in storage. So, but um, comparable, certainly. And then, you know, a variety like Sparkle, which has the highest bricks content, but is super soft um, and re- is really a pick your own berry. Um, yeah, much better. So, <laughs> the bigger, the juicier the berry, the right. shorter it's going to live. <laughs> yeah, it's a real tragedy. <laughs> That was kind of my experience, too, when I tried some of those berries in, I think, October. I was like, mm. wow, local berries in October. This is incredible. Yeah. Same thing. They were a little little harder, yeah. not quite as sweet, right. but it, it didn't matter because that was a still a fresh fruit in right. October. It's like, wow, that's great. <laughs> well, if only all customers agreed with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, once they believe you that it's grown here, right, right. <laughs> they open up to it a little bit. So we didn't talk about like um, ways to extend the season. So day neutral, it seems like two strategies, get them in as early as possible, or people are doing plug plants, which have been increasingly popular. And those you plant in the fall, you know, August, September. Um, and then you have a really early um, cycle that next spring. And that's, uh, that's not something that we've gotten into I kind of want to see more or trial more, just experiment more with getting plants in uh, day neutral plants early in the spring and then just see how they produce the next year as well. So we did with the day neutrals that we got in this year, we did cover with mulch and then we'll just see, see how they do in the spring. Um, And then I'll come back here, I guess. (laughs) Um, But then also, you know, uh, in terms of strategy, do you want to extend, how long do you want to extend the season? And so you, there are low tunnels, there's high tunnels. Does it make sense to put your strawberries in a high tunnel? Kind of dependent on market, I guess. But um, if you look at like overall yield um, versus other crops, tomatoes, greens, uh, they don't really hold up, you know, in terms of numbers. Um but if uh, maybe it's saturated with tomatoes, the, the local market that you have, and maybe greens too. Um, what, and then, what practices were you implementing um, for season extension, or were you, or yeah. were you so, just um, taking them as? We actually, kind? yeah, I got a hundred feet of um, the tunnel flex low tunnel set up, and they work well, really well. They're just a little bit labor intensive in terms of um, you know folding up and pulling down the plastic if you're doing that every day or but there uh, i mean the real benefit is that you have a lot less moisture that you're dealing with um so we always in the fall we have some heavy rains and just being able to divert that um out of the, the path of the strawberries would, was immensely valuable and so they worked well but in terms of Finances, if you're able to get an NRCS grant, and um, like I said, there aren't other, um, you know, higher value crops that you can do it, uh, throw in there. I would definitely recommend you can try out some strawberries and see how that works for you. So was the, what do you call it, tunnel flex? Tunnel flex, yeah. So is the tunnel flex system a requirement, you think, for pushing day neutrals into the fall? Uh, no, no, I didn't... Uh, no, I mean, so we did 100 feet, and we had 2,000 plants. Um, and so our spacing is pretty standard practice now, but it's uh, you, have on, you have one bed of plastic and then two rows per bed. They are planted every six inches, but they're staggered across the row, so in row, um, one-foot spacing. And so that means doing the math, 900 feet, that didn't have tunnel flex. Um, so... It really, you'd, you'd be fine, I think. Um, it obviously depends on the season um, and what the weather is like late fall. But like I said, we had strawberries going through uh, November without the tunnel flex. I, could we have pushed it another couple of weeks? Pro- yeah, probably with more coverage. You know, with the tunnel flex, I think in a really rainy season, you would see um, huge differences that could over time pay for this, the system. Tunnel Flex is not inexpensive, though. Mm. I would say that. Are there any tips, recommendations, or uh, practices that you really think are a necessity in order to be bringing berries to market in late fall? 
that you'd recommend for other farmers who might be interested in trying this practice? Um, irrigate with drip, fertigate. Um, they are, so the one thing about the unusual berries is that, uh, strawberries is that they're heavy feeders. So, um, just make sure to, um, get a soil test ahead of time and, and make sure that, um, you're feeding them enough. And that's, uh, so with our June bearing plants, we've always been careful not to add too much nitrogen because we've con- been concerned about soft berries. Um, and so that has been in the past sort of our hesitancy with, you know, for get, for getting nitrogen is, uh, well, we don't want to have soft berries, but these plants are, they're, they're growing and, um, and they're producing a lot and they're hungry. <laughs> so that was, that was kind of something that I had to overcome, I think, to get good yields. Did you have to overcome just like learning how to do it or just like, oh, I got to go through the effort of fertigating? Oh, um, no. I mean, fertigation, if you have the drip set up, it's, uh, it's not terribly difficult, but it is, it's a little nerve wracking when you're using pretty soluble fertilizers like chilean nitrate where it's like you send in all this nitrogen it's immediately available and because you have that sort of ingrained fear of having soft berries that <laughs> um you know every market people do they're kind of depending on us to bring them strawberries and so as awesome as it is to bring customers the berries that they want it's also it really sucks um if you it's, don't a, it's a risky procedure risky yeah, yeah i see All right. Well, Silas, thank you for coming on the show and chatting about day neutral strawberries. It was a lot of fun. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks so much, Andy. Thank you for listening to today's episode. I hope you go ahead and subscribe, share this with a friend or leave us a comment. And if you want more information, check out the show notes on our website at agengpodcast.com. That's A G E N G P O D C A S T dot com. Thanks for listening. I hope you have a great day. The proceeding has been a production of University of Vermont Extension. For more information on Extension, log on to www.uvm.edu extension.